Hello and welcome back to another update where I cover the latest developments throughout the front line in the Russo-Ukrainian war. It is your host Weep Union and in this one we start out in the Donetsk region where the Russians have advanced in the direction of Novokrovsky and in the direction of the northeast of Novo Alexandrivka. The Russians are here in the direction of Novopokrovsky, expanding their zone of control north and east of the village as they are closing in, edging in bit by bit towards the village before storming it directly. Over the past months, the Russians have been pushing west of Semenivka and south of Solovyove to expand the zone of control west of the villages now under Russian control. As well as north of Umansky following the capture of the village, this has allowed the Russians to align the front line according to numerous forest patches and roads added along the east of Novoslivka Persia and Novokrovsky. This is ahead of offensive operations towards both of these areas. The Russian focus right now is in the direction of Sokil and Novokrovsky to the north, where the objective of the Russians is to push through directly towards the Ukrainian fortifications north of Novoslivka Persia. These fortifications here are located on the high grounds and overlook the town. If the Russians capture Novokrovsky and move on to the fortifications and capture those, then they will have positions overlooking the entire town of Novoslivka Persia. And if they capture Sokil as well to the north, they'll be able to push down through the main road and ahead directly from the east will allow the Russians to attack Novoslivka Persia from two directions and have the high ground advantage. To push through towards Sokil, they have been advancing east and north of the village. This is in a similar case, north of the village there are fortified positions located on the high grounds. The Russians look to gain control over these fortified positions and attack Sokil from the east and the north. So it is the exact same position, situation and strategy that the Russians are using both towards Sokil and Novoslivka Persia. Further north in the direction of Novo Alexandrivka, the Russians have advanced northeast of the village to capture a forest line or two and force their way towards the Ukrainian fortified positions in the area. The Ukrainians have fortified positions northwest of Arkhangelsk, again located on the high grounds, but the Russian positions west of those are also on a high ground position, which means that there is no height advantage for the Ukrainian side or their fortified positions, especially since their fortified positions are facing in a southern and eastern direction and the Russians are attacking from the flank, flanking these fortified positions to likely continue to push northwards, ignoring these fortified positions or pushing the Ukrainians out of them with heavy bombardment and direct fire, forcing them to withdraw towards Kalinova as they push through to slowly gain control over the fortified positions in the area. If the Ukrainians simply remain in their fortified positions and the Russians continue pushing in a northern direction, the Russians will be able to flank them by cutting them off their, from their supplies through fighting in Kalinova, attacking from the weak left flank and pushing through. At the same time, the Russians pushing through here in the northern direction also allows the Russians to push through in a western direction towards the heights north of Novo Alexandrivka and flanking it from where the fortified positions if there are any, have been recently built, meaning that they aren't as effective as the ones that are older. But in general, the Ukrainians have been complained about the quality of the fortifications and the nature of them compared to the mission that they are assigned. We see that the Russians continue their offensive operations all around Ocheretene to the south, north and west of it as they attempt to expand their zone of control and develop their offensive operations. However, there has been no significant developments in the first week of June. Moving on further north in the direction of the Luhansk Kharkiv region, we see two reports. First off, here it's in the direction of Selmehivka, Vyasoharivka and Andrivka. The Russians are conducting positional fighting and operational assaults towards these villages as they attempt to move the front line in a straight line towards the Serbets river line and push the Ukrainians back towards these villages, as positional fighting also continues by Novosilivsky and Berestove. Further north, north of Ivanivka, the Russians have managed to gain control over this area north of the village. This has allowed the Russians to align the front line north of the village in an anticipation of an assault towards Sepova Novoselivka both from the east, south and north as they will attempt to bomb the village from multiple directions, capture the fortifications and cut off their supplies by pushing through along the highway and then moving on to Pishane and Ukraine fortifications in between Sepova Novoselivka and Kopiansk. In the Kharkiv direction where the Russians launched their offensive operations at the start or mid-May, 
The Russians and Ukrainians have reached a stalemate. Despite the Ukrainians having a 3 to 1 advantage, the Russians have been able to largely slow down or completely stop any Ukrainian advances with their counter-attacks which happen on a daily basis. The main reason for this is the Russian firepower allowing them to hit the Ukrainian positions when they are trying to gather enough forces within the villages and towns of Lipsy and Vovchansk, where they are attempting to build up enough forces to conduct a large counter-attack and push the Russians back. However, every such concentration of troops is hit by Russian FAB bombs. On a daily basis, we have tens of FAB bombs hitting each of these villages here in the north. There are approximately 25 Russian jets flying in this area, and they drop 50 to 100 FAB bombs every day. That means every single plane drops about two to four bombs a day. That includes two to four sorties every day. With that, we see that there's active Russian aviation in the area, and the Ukrainians are unable to deal with those, which gives the Russians a significant advantage. At the same time, the Russians are using troops within the Russian territory to hit the Ukraine positions with artillery from a distance of up to 30 kilometers, which means that the Russians have a large area in which they can actually launch artillery from in both directions of Vovchensk and Lipsy as they are close to the Russian border, which means that there's a fair distance between the Russian artillery positions and the towns that the Russians are fighting by. Other than the frontline developments, we have the speech of Putin, which happened yesterday, and he said a lot of very interesting statements. First off, the number of Russian soldiers in Ukrainian captivity and Ukrainian soldiers in Russian captivity, according to Putin, is 1,348 Russians in Ukrainian captivity and 6,465 Ukrainian soldiers in Russian captivity. That is 4.8 Ukrainian soldiers for every Russian soldier in Ukrainian captivity that is in Russian captivity. With that, we see later on that the Russian President Vladimir Putin claims that for every Russian soldier that is killed or wounded, five Ukrainian soldiers are killed or wounded. That means a five to one advantage to the Russians in terms of casualties. This is on contrary to the Ukrainians claiming somewhere between seven to one or 10 to one in favor of the Ukrainians. Naturally, there's no way to confirm or deny these numbers from either side, but based on the fact that the Ukrainians are struggling with manpower issues and have mobilized a massive army and still struggles with manpower issues and Russians having no active mobilization yet not suffering from manpower issues tends to speak for itself that the Russian numbers are likely more reliable than the Ukrainians in this case. If the Russians had lost 10 times as many soldiers as the Ukrainians, then they simply would not have any soldiers in Ukraine because they would be completely wiped out. In turn, the Russians claiming that the Ukrainians are taking about 50,000 casualties every month. If that is on average from the start of the war, that would be 1.5 million casualties. That is too much. However, this also includes lightly wounded, which same soldiers can be wounded multiple times. And we have seen that wounded Ukrainian soldiers do return to battle even if they have lost limbs or similar. This means that some one person can be wounded three or four times and then these numbers become realistic. At the same time, this would mean that the Russians, according to Putin, have suffered 300,000 casualties of both killed and wounded. This naturally does not include other groups. But at the same time, the current rate of casualties is slightly higher on both sides than it was a year ago, considering that the Ukrainians and Russians both have a large amount of soldiers at the front. Putin also claims that the Ukrainians mobilize about 30,000 people every month, and the Russians are at the, about the same rate as the Russians recruit somewhere around 30 to 40,000 soldiers a month. If the Russians take 10,000 casualties a month and recruit 40,000 or 30,000 soldiers a month, they would have a net increase of 20 to 30,000 soldiers every month. In comparison, the Ukrainians, considering that they take 50,000 casualties according to Putin, if we say half of those are lightly wounded and they will return, that means 25,000 permanent casualties every month. That would be a net increase of 5,000 soldiers a month for their armed forces. Based on that information, we could say that the Russians are increasing at a faster rate 
both strength and quantity of the armed forces in comparison to the Ukrainians, as if you suffer less casualties, then you'll have more experienced soldiers and the quality of your soldiers will increase. If you have more casualties, then the quality will decrease as your experienced soldiers will be left wounded or killed. Therefore, the statement of Putin pretty much aligns with my own analysis that the Russians are growing in strength at a faster pace than the Ukrainians are losing strength at a somewhat steady pace. This means that the longer the war goes on, the stronger the Russian army will be, the weaker the Ukrainian army will be. He then goes on to say that the war could end within two to three months. He claims that as soon as the Americans stop sending weapons to Ukraine, then the war will end. This means either of two things, either the Russians will launch a large offensive once the Ukrainians does stop receiving aid from the United States, or that he expects that the Ukrainians will surrender if the United States stops sending aid to Ukraine. Finally, he says, strikes against the Russian Federation with the participation of Western countries mean their direct war against Russia. That is up to interpretation what exactly he means by participation in direct strikes. It could be the Western countries sending AWACS over Ukraine to help scout out Russian territory to direct the fire of Ukrainian units shooting into Russian territories of Belgorod or Kursk or similar regions where the Ukrainians have been given permission to shoot with Western weapon into these territories. And if direct war between Russia and the West happens, then that may very easily escalate to nuclear war. This could be a deterrence or threat to Western nations. Do not attempt to strike or help strike Russian territory. Otherwise, well, World War Three. And this is because he's pretty much drawing a red line. Then everyone loves to laugh about his red lines. They just get passed and passed. Well, he never specifies what the consequences are. He just says there will be consequences. And now he specifies that the consequence of directly participating in direct strikes against Russian territory would mean direct war between those countries. And that is going to be all for this update. Thank you all for watching. Make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and check out my Patreon for additional content. Thank you all for watching, and have a great day.